So let me start with the story. So I was coming down to my apartment parking lot and there was a bunch of people around this car, pointing at it, admiring it, talking about it. Now, this parking lot is always full of exotic and expensive cars. Rolls Royce, Bentleys, Aston Martins, McLarens, a whole bunch of Porsches, you name them, they're there. But all eyes were on this car and when I arrived on me, well at least for five minutes until they figured out it's not actually my car. But that in essence is 90% of this car's appeal right here. The Mercedes AMG G63, to me, one of the best ways to spend one and a half million ringgit of your own money on a car in Malaysia. First up, an introduction to the Mercedes G-Class or the Glando Wagon. It was originally thought up as a military vehicle in the 70s, but civilian versions were sold to the public from 1979. Over the years, it was made more and more luxurious to a point where it became a design icon, popular among the rich and famous around the world. So all of that sort of happened by accident and the G-Wagon was never designed to be a luxury vehicle right from the very start. It was supposed to be a crude little off-roader designed for the rough stuff, not to please high-end fashionistas or, you know, Kanye West. So underneath the whole body is an old-school ladder frame construction. That's the sort of thing you find in, you know, pickup trucks and buses. That's more suited for heavy-duty applications such as taking punishment from heavy loads rather than, you know, pampering highbrow passengers inside. So for the longest time, the G-Class was the Mercedes that looked and felt the least like a contemporary Mercedes. I mean, there's only so much you can dress up an old grumpy grandfather. So when it came to Mercedes to replace the now iconic model, it was a big task. It tried to do a completely modern SUV with the Mercedes GL in 2006, but that failed badly. Then there was the Vision Energy Force concept in 2012, supposedly a futuristic take on the G-Class styling. But what the customers really want is a proper G-Class, as is. No modern nonsense. So Mercedes-Benz finally buckled and launched this, the second generation G-Class, which just so happens to look pretty much identical to the 40-year-old original. I won't call this car styling retro or classic just yet, just because I don't think cars from the 70s or 80s are old enough to be considered classics just yet. To me, most of them are just plain old cars. This, I describe as proper old school. But that's not such a bad thing because my god is this such a good looking car. Driving it makes you feel like a rock star with all eyes looking at you. This is pretty much the perfect car for the Instagram generation that we live in. It's, you know, such a bangsa kind of car, if you get what I mean. With this car, it's not so much about the length because it's about the same length as a Mercedes-Benz GLC. But this one is also 2 meters wide and 2 meters tall. So on the road, it looks super imposing with mega road presence. To me, it looks fantastic. fan bloody -tastic. From the vertical nose, flat fenders and wide wheelage extensions, exposed door hinges and even the rear-mounted spare tire, it's a timeless design. Styling-wise, I love this thing, but there are two things that annoy the heck out of me. Number one, the side mirrors look way too rounded to match the rest of the car. And at the back, there's this little mud flaps at the back here. Like, seriously, what's that about? Now, if you've noticed, there are no exhaust pipes back here. That's because this car has side exit pipes and they look great, sound even better. Trying to get in, you notice that this car does not have keyless entry, which is funny because this is a million dollar car. But that's because they couldn't fit in a button or a sensor on its old school push button type door handles. So you gotta go old school and use the old button. Yeah, but you hear that? Even locking and unlocking the door makes quite a bit of drama. Now, the door itself is quite something else too. Opening and closing it feels so heavy, feels so substantial. It's like closing one of those big old fridge doors. Yeah, that's proper old school.
Climbing in takes some practice and the sidestep is actually quite high but absolutely essential here. If you're wearing a skirt, well, tough luck. And then you gotta slam the door hard to close it properly because, you know, the last thing you want is to walk towards the car looking cool as hell and then... Oop, sorry, not close properly. And once you're in, you're in for a surprise because the new G-Class really is all new here with a fully modern interior. It's cool, it's unique, and the best thing is, it still keeps the old G-Class highlights such as these triple differential buttons here and the grab handle for the front passenger. And quality is fantastic too, with pretty much everything within reach, feeling expensive, soft, leather lined in Nepal leather, even down here, look. But it's not perfect though. The window controls down here are taken straight off the Mercedes A-Class and the plastic bits feel at odds with the rest of the cabin. I mean, remember, this car is twice as much as an S-Class Mercedes and it gets A-Class buttons? Come on, Mercedes. Another thing, unlike the A-Class, the G doesn't get the latest MBUX interface with its fancy Hey Mercedes voice command system. So this is still the old command online system and it's still not a touchscreen. And I have one more issue with this interior, but this could just be me. Now, I adore all these new turbine jet icon vents, but because they're mounted a little bit low in this cabin, you have to point it like that at an extreme angle to hit your face. I don't know about you, call me OCD or whatever, but this just looks wrong. So I find myself adjusting it right to the middle so it looks better until I feel hot again, and then it goes back to the previous positions. But again, you know, could just be me. This being an AMG model, it has a few AMG specific parts, like this new steering wheel which is oddly shaped because it has flat sides. It also has red carbon fibre trim, IWC clock face and bright red seat belts. This car also has a customizable digital cluster, 64 colour ambient lighting, a small sunroof and a 15 speaker Burmester audio system. Also to note, the rear doors are rather short and they don't open that wide. Together with a high step in, entry into the back seat is quite tricky especially if you're short or big, or worse still, poor. Once in, the space isn't exactly great. Leg room could be better, but head room and shoulder room are both fantastic, so you can definitely fit three adults in the back here. And the seats themselves are fairly comfortable, plus you can also recline them a fair bit, not bad. Word of warning though, these large rear windows don't have any sun blinds on them, and the air conditioning system can feel a little bit weak for this car, and it struggles to cool down this whole cabin, so you're likely to leave them on maximum most of the time. As for the boot, it's massive at over 650 litres, and absolutely enormous with the rear seats down, even though there's a big step on the floor, and there's also no place to keep the tonneau cover when not in use. What's good is this leather line panel here, completely unnecessary but a lovely touch anyway. What's not so good is the side hinge rear door because you need such a big space to access the boot. If you're in a tight parking lot, well again, tough luck. As for the door itself, there's no power boot here, it's all manual. And before you close it, you better make sure there's nothing or nobody in the way because this thing is heavy. Now let's go drive this thing. First thing you need to know about the G63 is that you sit extremely high in it. From up here, every other car looks really, really small. A Myvi looks like a miniature car. And even pickup trucks like a Hilux, a Ranger, or whatever, you are taller than them. So yeah, this really is something else. The view from up top, they say, is really, really good. And with this thing, I agree. And beyond being just high, the sitting position is also a bit unique because this is a proper SUV sitting position. See my leg down here, it's going down straight because you're sitting really upright and the steering is right, right close to your chest for you to, you know, maneuver quickly with the steering wheel and I think it really fits the, the, the size and the girth of this thing. It's a lot better than the old G-Class. The old G-Class had this really weird flat steering wheel it's like you're driving one of those 70s truck. This one feels a lot more normal. But beyond a G-Class, this is also an AMG, so... So what dominates the driving experience is the engine. 
Up front is an angry 4 litre AMG V8 twin turbo making 585 horsepower and 850 newton meters of torque. That's more power and more torque than Mercedes's own supercar, the AMG GTR. On this big thing, sitting so high up, you really feel every single horsepower. It's insane. Especially on the highways, you plant your foot down. It takes about a second for the car to like gather everything up and shoot down the road. But once it does, it does it with such character and such noise that it sounds like you know a Gatling gun is going on it's insane wait let me find a nice clearing for us to go in three two one yep and yeah we're well into illegal speeds right now so this car gets from 0 to 100 in 4.5 seconds. That's unbelievably fast. This is a car that weighs two and a half tons, way more than two and a half tons. So going under five seconds is incredible. Can you imagine this thing is as fast to 100 as the Mercedes A45 AMG? You know how small and light that thing is? And because when something is so big and so tall and so heavy, when it's fast, it's really something else. And for the most part, the previous G-Class was already crazy fast. I mean, that was a car with chassis from the 70s with a big modern AMG V8 up front. And that thing couldn't handle for to save its life. You throw that thing a pair of corners and it'll just plow through the center. You know, it'll come up at the end of the road, you know, unscathed of course, because it's a G-Class and it's unbreakable. But the driver, it's not so much fun. This, it's a whole different story. Now, I'm not gonna say Mercedes has turned the G-Class into a you know, nimble SUV because it's not. This is still as tall as ever. Feels like you're sitting, you know, looking down from a triple-story house. And, yeah, there's still a little bit of body roll because this, after all, is still a leather frame chassis. It's not gonna be as stiff as a monocoque car. So, to drive fast through the corners, I wouldn't say it's fun, it's more like sort of amazing that this car can actually turn. So you sort of get fun in a different way because you know, you're more like astounded that this big heavy thing can actually take corners and take corners well. It's not fun, I mean not in the natural sense of the word, but you know, from behind the wheel, it's incredible. Like you throw everything at it and like wow this thing can take it and you know whatever you can throw at it it goes back at you like is that it i can do more bro one thing i have to mention is the steering the old car had a recirculating ball steering that's something from i don't know the 50s or whatever before i was born so i don't i don't need to know this one is on a much more modern rack and pinion and finally it's electro hydraulic power steering so you get a little bit of feel i wouldn't say it's like dead like most eps's out there but it finally has a quick enough rack for you to drive like a normal car. The old car was so slow in terms of steering, you had to do like two, three full locks to make a turn. This one, half a lock is enough for you to maneuver through most turns. But one thing though, because it has such a fast rack, the turning circle is absolutely rubbish. Going through my own apartment parking lot, I find myself having to do like mini three-point turns to maneuver through the tiny, tight ramps. So yeah, that's not so much fun. But what we keep going back to is the ladder frame chassis. And yes, this still rides on that old school utilitarian, heavy duty, whatever you want to call it. You know, something that should not be on a modern Mercedes, not a modern car at least. But you know what? It's something similar to what Porsche is doing with the 911. Porsche keeps perfecting the 911 while keeping what makes it so unique, what makes it so special, having the engine way at the back. Ask anybody, they'll say that it's not the right way, not the right place to put an engine. And Porsche agrees. If you look at all their hypercars, the Carrera GT, the 918 Spyder, those all had the engine right in the middle. So Porsche itself knows putting engine in the back is not the right way to do it. If they were to do a, a modern 911 with engine right in the middle, the car will have better dynamics. You better bet on it. And Porsche knows it as well. But if they do that, 
can they still call it 9-11? Can people accept that it's a 9-11? Of course not. And that's exactly what Mercedes is doing with the G-Wagon. If this is built on a proper monocoque chassis, it will be a much, much better car. It will be better than a, you know, a Porsche Cayenne in terms of dynamics. It could be better than the Range Rover in terms of comfort and you know, the way it pleases its, its passengers. But no, it sticks to the old school G-Class classic manner, having an old school you know, ladder frame chassis. It needs to have that old school feel to it. Beyond that, it's not going to be a proper G-Class. And with that, there are quite a few drawbacks because the ride is a little bit unsettled. This is a much more rigid chassis compared to the old one. It now has modern materials, high strength steel and all that, and it is 50% stiffer compared to the old, you know, leather frame chassis. That's from the 70s. But then again, 50% stiffer than the ancient 40 year old chassis is not really such a good thing, is it? I mean, for sure by now, normal monocoques have tripled or quadrupled in terms of its chassis stiffness. This has only gone up by 50% and weight has only gone down by 170 kilograms. This, so that's down from 2.7 tons down to 2.5 tons. You know, not such a big deal. That's less than 10% savings in terms of weight. So yeah, Mercedes can't really claim that they have completely renewed this car because they really haven't. This is still, from top to bottom, a fairly old school vehicle and really feels it. The ride especially is you know, quite bouncy, especially at high speeds. And through sharp ruts, there's a little bit of a shimmy from, this, from the whole chassis. You can feel that, you know, it's not quite as stiff as a modern car should be. So there's a lot of compromises when it comes to the driving dynamics of this car. Nowhere near as many as the old car, of course, but there's still quite a few with this. And while we're on the subject of weight, this car drinks fuel. Let's, you know, let's not joke about it. It really does. I've driven this car for about 600 kilometers through the highways to Ipoh and back, through a lot of city driving as well. And I have averaged around 20 liters per 100 kilometers. That is five kilometers per liter. That's right, for every single liter you put into the pump, into the car, you only get five kilometers out of it. So yeah, this is a very, very thirsty car. And talking about fuel, this car is rated for Ron 98. I mean, it can take Ron 95, but it won't run to its full potential. So yeah, better look around for those Ron 100s and VPR fuels, boys. But it's not as if Mercedes has not worked hard on the fuel consumption. This is significantly more fuel efficient compared to the ones that have come before. The engine is now a 4 litre V8 instead of, you know, monstrous 5.5 litre or 6.3 litre engines. And if you're pootling around town, this actually has cylinder deactivation technology. So there's a small little logo that says for cylinder mode. So if you're driving around town very slowly, you know, like, you know, most hybrids with their EV modes, this car is actually running around with just four cylinders. And if you put your foot down, it automatically shuts back down to become a V8. You don't actually feel the transition, so that's a good thing. But then again, yeah, four cylinders or eight cylinders, there's no denying this thing's a fuel guzzler. Back to cabin comfort, there has to be a special mention for this car's seats because these are quite amazing seats, I must say. They are fairly comfortable, they are fairly supportive, but it's also dynamic. So as you turn into a corner, the car will sort of like hug you back to keep you in place. It's annoying at first, but after a while, you sort of like depend on it, and then you jump into a different car without the same feature, you're like, you know, there's something missing right here. So it's a bit weird. There's also massage functions for both the front seats. Not great, you can't compare it against an Osim or Ogawa or whatever it is, but better than nothing. And at the end of the day, you do feel a little bit refreshed as you come out of the car. And that's the best thing about this car. It's not a cruiser because it's not very comfortable on the highways. It's still a bit bumpy and bouncy. It's not a bruiser because you can't really take corners to save its life. What it is, is a boulevardier. It's something to roll down your favorite street 
in style, slow motion, your you know, el elbows hanging out, perhaps with a cigar in hand, and you look like an absolute rock star. It's the perfect car for that. On to refinement, well, as you can hear, there's a lot of engine noise in here. And you know, to some people that could be a good thing. For me, it's all right. And you can actually adjust the exhaust noise level by having a button here. That adjusts it from being really, really loud to being the Hulk angry. So yeah, it's a little bit of a choice, but you know, it doesn't really change all that much. But anyway, on to the standard terms of refinement. There's a lot of wind noise in this car. The windows are all double glazed. That's like two layers of glass put together to sort of like keep the sound, keep the wind noise all out of the car. But this is shaped like a brick still. So it's not the best when it comes to cutting through the air in terms of aerodynamics. So there's a lot of wind noise going around, especially as you go beyond say 130, 140. At 160, it becomes extremely loud. You end up having to blast your music to drown down the, the wind noise and you can't talk to your passengers unless you scream at them. So yeah, it can get a little bit unpleasant. It's the kind of car that cruises, you know, at its best around 110 to 130, not much more than that. There's also the issue of tyre raw because this car runs on massive 295, 40 R22s, yes, 22s on all four corners. And there's a little bit of tyre raw at whatever speed that you go in. And those tyres, while they give you immense grip as you drive along in the dry, they are honestly rubbish in the wet. Drive this car in the wet, you better take it really, really easy because unless you want your genitals to rise up and be right there, trust me, by experience, you'd want to take it slow. So yeah, as a whole, the G63 is a lot better than the old one, but as a modern car, it's not that great. But it's a very likeable car, you know. Unlike the old one, it's not something that falls apart as you throw a couple of quarters in it. This one, it can handle most of the things that you throw at it. And it's incredibly fast. It sounds like that. And it looks like this. So I love it. I love it. So this is it, the Mercedes-AMG G63 or the G-Wagon, the Galando wagon, the Godfather, whatever you want to call it. In short, this is the best G-Class there ever is. It asks for the least number of compromises and it's also unbelievably quick. The interior is fantastic and driving it no longer feels like you're on a 70s era truck. But as a modern SUV, it's still deeply flawed. The space is not especially big inside and the ride is still bouncy. And you know what? This drinks fuel like it's absolutely free. Not to forget, it handles like a high-rise apartment. And in Malaysia, it costs about the same too. So yes, this is definitely not a kind of car you buy based on logic. There are much better, much cheaper SUVs out there. But as a fashion statement, with its looks and its image, the G-Class stands on a class of its own. As they say, if you've got it, flaunt it, and I'm a firm believer of that. If you have the means, just take a look at it and ask yourself, why the hell not?